this computer. Okay, so the recording started. Okay, so let's begin. Um, thanks for, for joining everyone. This is the, the first in this year's uh, um, seminar series, the Geography at Trinity College, uh, Dublin. And as we did in the last academic year, the kind of uh, the semester one, we are working with kind of people from uh, Trinity College, both from our own department and from uh, from others. Um, and then in semester two, we'll kind of start in inviting uh, guests from outside uh, uh, Trinity. Um, and we're delighted today to start with uh, Ruth Brennan from TCD, from the Centre of Environmental Humanities, um, who was a Marie Curie Fellow uh, for the last few years in Trinity College at the Centre for Environmental Humanities and as a, a researcher and scholar working both kind of inside the acad academia in Trinity, but also outside as an independent scholar, as well as an advisor to uh, an MEP, uh, Luke Campbell, um, on um, fisheries governance and, and other aspects of environmental governance for the European Union. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And particularly delighted to have Ruth with us, with us today because we had invited her last uh, year and she wasn't able to, to come because of uh, unforeseen circumstances. So we were disappointed to, to miss her at that point, but delighted that we've, uh, uh, we'll have her joining us today. Um, so the structure will be a little bit different today and that'll, that'll become apparent why when, we, when Ruth starts presenting her work. Um, one of the reasons that myself and others were keen to invite Ruth is that, uh, I mean, she's doing fantastic work in the environmental humanities um, and, you know, I guess the field of environmental humanities has got a lot of crossover, a lot of geographers working in the environmental humanities um, and using kind of new kind of methods and creative, creative methods and techniques to carry out research and distribute uh, research results. And uh, I think Ruth is, is one of the people doing great work um, in this regard, particularly around environmental governance of fisheries in our small scale fisheries, she'll talk about. And so given that the, the different way that Ruth approaches her work, and I'll hand over to her to talk about this in a, in a second. Um, the structure will be a bit different. Ruth is gonna give a little bit of an intro, then screen a film, um, a short animated film as a collaborative project, um, and also read some poems that she's written that's come out of her research. And then what we'll do is kind of open up a little bit of a, a dialogue sooner than we normally would. And I'll kind of lead that, but then turn it over to, to the rest of um, uh, others to, to, to bring it in. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ruth, and uh, we're going to have to to close at, at two as we normally do. Um, given that I'm in charge of the Zoom and I need to use my computer, <laughs> we will have to leave at two on the dot today. But uh, so, thank you very much for for joining, and thanks Ruth for joining us. I'll hand it over to you to to um, start your your presentation. Thanks, Rory, and thanks so much for the invitation uh, today. And it's great that after not being able to do it earlier in the year, that I was able to come back. Um, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces and names from the many coffee mornings I spent in geography over the last few years. Um, and also to people to see people from outside academia. I spotted Seamus Bonner and Brian Reardon there, uh, which is fantastic. Thank you for coming. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to uh, give a, a short introduction uh, just to give you a little bit of context um, around the research I was doing between 2018 and 2020, um, which uh, was focused at the interface of fisheries, environmental policy and fisheries dependent communities, particularly offshore island communities. Um, and that research brought questions of politics, environments and community life to the fore, and particularly questions of equity and equitable governance. Um, so between 2018 and 2020, uh, I engaged with Irish island fishing communities, the fishing industry in Ireland and the Irish policy environment um, in examining and exploring the challenges faced by island fishing communities and their initiatives to manage island fisheries in a way that uh, suits the particularities of small scale island fisheries on a collective seasonal basis. Uh, and this involved working with a crossroots, uh, a cross islands grassroots cooperative, the Irish Islands Marine Resource Organization, or IMRO, who is represented here today by Seamus uh, Bonner. Um, and over the last five years in particular, IMRO has actively tried to address the challenges uh, for small scale island fishers and to engage very actively with the policy environment. Um, and uh, Two of the ways which they did this was uh, by spearheading two governance initiatives for the management of uh, island fisheries, 
One was to set up a fish producer organization specific to the island's fleet. And a producer organization basically deals with the management of day-to-day -day fisheries. Um, but up to very recently, the fish producer organizations in existence in Ireland, uh, the members were pretty much uh, only the large, uh, the, the larger kind of commercial industrial fleet. There wasn't one specifically for small-scale fishers or for small-scale island fishers. So that was one initiative. They wanted to set up a producer organization specific to the island's fleet. And secondly, they've tried to um, uh, push forward legislation to provide island small scale fishers with ring fenced access to valuable quota controlled species in island waters. Now, when I say quota controlled species, I'm talking about the fishing quota that is allocated each year from EU level to member states. And um, these uh, fishing quotas are based on total allowable catches or tax that are fixed annually by the Council of Ministers. So basically, the quota is given by the EU to member states which sets out how much of each particular quota control species member states are allowed to fish, and then they decide how that is divvied up and controlled at a national level. Um, now, one other important piece of context is that in Ireland, unlike in other EU member states where uh, fishing rights are uh, privatised, Ireland has a critical policy objective in the management of fisheries, and it defends this fiercely. And uh, its critical policy objective is to manage fishing opportunities or quota control stocks as a public resource. Its stated reasoning behind this is to ensure that fishing opportunities are not concentrated into the hands of large fishing operators and to maintain a strong link between fishing vessels and communities where alternative economic activities may not be available. And this sentiment is laudable, but it doesn't work out like this in practice, particularly for small scale fishers in offshore island communities. In practice, what happens is that access to these valuable quota control stocks is shaped by historical assumptions that reinforce the world's or ontological realities of larger vessels. While different requirements combine to frustrate the attempts of small scale vessels to assert a reality that's designed around their differences. And so the islanders and island fishers find themselves caught in the cogs of a regulatory regime that is focused more on individual economic profit uh, and on the growth of the blue economy than on the socio-ecological and social justice complexities of issues that reach far beyond the fisheries governance context. And one of my key findings in this research was that the current fisheries government system um, produces inequities for small-scale fishers in Ireland. And this is despite this critical policy objective of managing fisheries as a public resource and of not having quota control species concentrated in the hands of larger vessels. Um, so. To illustrate this, um, as Rory said, I've chosen for this talk to focus on kind of the more creative um, outputs uh, of this research. Um, so to illustrate this, I'm going to first share the voices of some of the islanders, direct voices of the islanders uh, through some poetry. And then um, I'll move to a short um, seven minute fisheries animation that explains the complexities of being a small scale fisher uh, in a system designed around large scale operators. And one of the reasons that I've chosen kind of these methods is because the fisheries governance and the fishery system is highly technical and highly technocratic um, and uh, using visual and more creative methods has proven to be quite an effective way of explaining what is a really, really complex story. Um, so uh, yeah, in relation to the poems, um, and I can speak a little bit more about this later in the discussion maybe, but during the data analysis process, this, this wasn't an output that I had intended um, to create poems, but during the data analysis process, I ended up arranging some of my raw interview data into a collection of seven found poems. Um, now, found poems are poems that consist solely of data provided by the research participants, so that they're, they're their words, it's the raw data from them that I've arranged into the poems. And these poems that I made feature a mosaic of voices from the islands, from uh, policymakers, and from the wider fishing industry. Um, although the poem I'm going to share now uh, is solely the voices of Irish islanders. And this poem that I'm going to share with you now, just one of them, is about how difficult it is for young people in particular uh, to enter the small scale fishing industry. And it's called, I love it. I love it, but I wouldn't do it. We have been told growing up, Oh, don't get into fishing. I love it. Coming back and doing it over the summer, but I wouldn't do it. I couldn't see myself settling for it. You go to college, you get bigger ideas and bigger goals. I could do a lot of work from home. There needs to be financial rewards to keep people in these places. 
I think what needs to be done really is a hand up more than a handout. Level the playing field, I think. That could be the hand up they would need to make this profitable here. Here, it is a lot more complicated. There is more planning. Being able to tie the boat at the pier is crucial for us to live. People on the mainland can just land in and go up to their house. These people are making money and that is what the government sees. And that works, capitalism. You would never consider fishing here because it is just such a hassle. You don't have the harbours, you can't do it in the winter time, it is just not on. If the year is good all right, you might get October, November, but after that, it might be May or April again before you would be able to go fishing because it is too shallow and too rough. People were fishing here just because they were living here. Fishing to us was a break from the land and you enjoyed doing it. It's not looked at as an attractive place to fish. Because if you are a business and if you're fishing, it is a business, you have to think profit and loss and there is just too much loss. So what I'm gonna do now is um, share my screen for the, uh, and play the fisheries animation, which is just under um, seven minutes. And uh, this uh, was a, a collaborative piece of work with a um, filmmaker, illustrator and animator, uh, Mish Rosanoff, and also with a, an Irish musician, uh, Brian McGlynn, who, if anybody is into folk music might know, uh, he's one half of you vagabonds that recently won the uh, Irish Folk Music Awards. Um, so let me just share my screen and I can play this for you here. Share. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. That was great. And uh, also to your, your collaborators who obviously aren't, aren't here on, on, the, on the film, but maybe maybe we will hear from, uh, from Seamus uh, Bonner later if he, if he uh, feels like uh, jumping in at some point. But maybe first um, I'd ask you about, I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit already, but what, what kind of brought you in your own kind of research to, to start using creative methods like uh, poetry, but also maybe previously working with animated film? What were the kind of things that brought you in your research, research path to, to pursue this? I think initially it was it was during my my PhD when I started my PhD it was back in 2009 because I was doing my PhD part time over, over six years and I was um, investigating another conflict this time around marine conservation marine protected area and uh, the picture that had been the pictures that had been kind of presented really in the media was very black and white as in um, people against this marine protected area government against people. And as I spent more time in my fieldwork trying to kind of unravel what the complexities of the pictures of the stories were, I realized that um, it was very clear to me that words weren't going to be sufficient to kind of convey it because oh. when, when, when I'm using words, I'm choosing uh, particular meanings and I'm choosing what to leave in, what to leave out. And, and I really felt that um, I wanted to work with a medium that allowed for uh, greater meanings to co to, for, for more meanings to coexist simultaneously. Um, so I had already initially thought of, of working with, with images with my participants to get them to kind of give me images that we could then again, then discuss, but then that people could respond to those images um, um, differently depending on, on, on their positionality and where they were coming from. And having already decided that I, um, uh, I, uh, ended up meeting an artist and filmmaker, Stephen Hurl, a Glasgow based artist and filmmaker. And the island that I was doing research on, Barra in the Outer Hebrides, he was also wanting to make some work and to go back to that island because his mother was from there and to make some work. He thought that my research approach was uh, very like an environmental arts approach. I had no idea what that was. And I really liked his research because it's very much or his arts process because he does publicly engaged arts. So that reminded me uh, that spoke to me as a social scientist. So there were, there were overlaps in our processes. So we started collaborating. So that's really how the kind of the creative um, kind of visual methods started one from from uh, from meeting Stephen and, and collaborating with him, but two from just being very aware of the the the, the inability of words to, to, to capture what I was trying to capture. Mm. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny in, in one sense, there's a kind of a, a back and forth between complexity and uh, maybe not simplicity, but accessibility. Um, I mean, if, the first time I saw, you know, let's say the broad speaking uh, genre of a kind of a research animated film was the, the David Harvey film, which I don't know if you saw that after the 2008 financial crash. And it was just David Harvey, of course, geographer, you know, droning as he does <laughs> his lecture about Marxism. But it was it was uh, animated by these British animators to try and, and uh, br bring a wider audience to it. But I think that's that was a much simpler format in the sense of it's just here's someone talking and these these uh, images illustrated. Whereas I think what you're trying to do is, is capture something a bit more. It's not just illustrate the words, but mm. it's to try and capture something that words can't uh, capture, like a kind of multiple voices. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that kind of ties in again to the, to the poems. I know you're kind of talking about the, the limitations of words, um, but there's also something about bringing in more complexity in, in the poems through language and multiple uh, voices. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, about how you've tried to add complexity in the poems through the use of other people's words. Yeah, I mean, that was, um, I'll answer your question first and then will do you want to go to your questions first and then i'll go to questions i can see coming in on the chat yeah, or we'll, 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 maybe yeah. we'll, uh, i'll kind of we'll kind of chat and then we'll kind of come to those in, in a, in a bit right. five minutes or so okay so yeah in relation to the in, in relation to the poetry again as i kind of mentioned at the outset that 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 wasn't intentional that was kind of accidental how i came to poetry but i suppose my my aim always through the research is to provide a space for um, where kind of often contradictory meanings and uh, can can coexist rather than trying to kind of put forward a I mean my research never tries to put forward a solution as such 
it's 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 much more focused on trying to um define the problem or show different ways in which in, in, in which a problem will be framed so it ends up kind of raising more questions than 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 providing solutions um and in relation to the poetry um how how that came about. I mean, I, I'm, in my research, I had always tried to foreground voices of the research participants. I mean, one of the the previous arc science collaborations that I did was an online cultural map of the sea called Sea Stories, and there you had the voices of research participants that are actually telling um, the stories of, say, fishing marks or reefs or rocks or whatever that are that are in the ocean. So it's 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 not mediated through me. It is direct. It's mediated through me in, in the sense that. As a team, we decided what representation, what stories would be in, mm -hmm. in the map, but it is people's direct voices there. Uh, so poetry was kind of a, a, another means of doing that. Um, but I didn't even know that you could create poetry from, uh, from research data. And what happened, I was writing an academic paper on and was during lockdown one, and I was, I was really struggling with the academic paper, writing the academic paper and the focus I needed to do that in the early kind of stages of lockdown one. Um, and I just to, I, I knew that I needed to play <laughs> to get my brain like a little oh. to get it out of that really kind of focus bit where everything was stuck and I had left a note for myself to play with arranging the the the, the research data which I knew very well at that stage and had already arranged into themes to, to, to play with creating poetry from that um so I gave myself a whole day where I was just allowed to play with my research data and creating kind of different poems and uh, alternating the, the the voices and I really enjoyed it and when I had finished I looked at it and thought wow I think there is actually something in this but I wasn't sure so I sent it to three friends who were poets I sent I sent uh, I sent them to, to Seamus Bonner I sent them to um, a colleague, uh, Wes uh, Flannery in Queen's University, Belfast, uh, and I sent them to people in the policy environment as well, just to get kind of feedback. Um, and the feedback was quite positive. And it was thanks to Wes Flannery that um, I was pointed towards ACME as a place because I wouldn't have considered uh, publishing them as an in, in an academic oh. uh, journal. My idea then was to have the poems and for that to be, and it still is, that, that the plan is, uh, so the poems are there as text. What I would like to do at a future date is to uh, another art science collaboration with the poems. So to go back to the islands to get um, people like say storytellers to record them reading them mm -hmm. and then also work maybe with Michigan for an animation. So you would have those poems that are actually animated, but that are are read and, and spoken through the the, the voices um, of islanders um, or other people if it's not islanders voices in there. Mm -hmm. How, how did I mean? Maybe it's a difficult question to, to answer. But how did the the your research participants or those you're working with, um, the islanders, how did they how have they responded to the poems? And when you've when you've shared them with them, have they been excited to see their words appear in this context, or uh, what have the, what have their mm -hmm. responses been? I haven't got to share them because <laughs> you haven't seen them yet. <laughs> no, because it's because it was COVID by the time I yeah. I, I created those poems. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so I haven't got to share them with the, uh, with Islanders apart from, uh, apart from Seamus, who, Seamus who, who comes, who comes to these talks. Um, but no, it's like, ideally what I would have done, for example, in Barrow, when I was sharing kind of the, the online map of the sea or whatever, I would organize a community event and go mm -hmm. there in person rather than, um, kind of create a, a, an online event for that and that hasn't happened yet but that's also why um my for me those poems are a work in progress in that they're not necessarily in the best format to be shared with uh with the people whose voices they are yet mm. i mean they're not they're there and they work but first of all they work better as spoken word rather than as words on the page but there there's too much life in them just to stay as kind of mm. black and white words on the page i i i think they need to be lifted off through through another medium and um, so yeah the kind of wider sharing is yet to come <laughs> yeah the, the, i mean one thing i thought i had as i mentioned before we we started talking um with uh, the audience here that uh i'd never heard of a fine poem this kind of idea of taking kind of the research materials or direct quotations but uh, but it, it does remind me of kind of the more classical kind of modernist techniques of collage and cut up where mm -hmm. you would kind of there's perhaps more intentionality of how the mm. bricolage is made but you're kind of, yeah. and it's also got this participatory uh, element to it, which I think is is great. There was there's a sentence in there where it says, uh, "Here is a lot more complicated." Um, 
And I think that's that's almost to me the, the like you were saying, your research has never been to give solutions, but to kind of, you know, problematize problems. <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. that's what my teaching is, at least uh, sometimes maybe it frustrates mm -hmm. the students. But I think that's that's almost like the, the sentence, which is of the it almost captures the uh, the what ge geographic thought does as well. Here mm -hmm. is a lot more complicated and taking mm -hmm. away from, say, that in your case, the large scale fisheries with this kind of quite flat economist kind of uh, economic kind of ontology to much more complex ways of thinking about our relationships to the to place and to, to the, mm -hmm. the particular fisheries. Um, maybe we Actually, should, what's your, go sorry, ahead. Rory, just one thing, because you were asking me that question about what, what, what was the response of Islanders. And I, Seamus, can I put you on the spot? Because we do have an Islander here who can, who can give that her That would be spot. great. <laughs> and you know the poems, if you want to jump in. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Seamus. I'm based in Arnmore in Donegal. Um, and thanks for or include me in the discussion. Um, yeah, the, the poems are, as I think, as Ruth mentioned, I think if, if they are voiced as a, a sound recording for, for getting the word out there, but they do give a very good perspective, I think from, you know, it's they're not dry um, analysis, that they, they give sort of personal perspective on, you know, the day-to-day -day issues that you run into as a, a small scale fisherman or a woman on the islands, you know, so that's that's um, I think that's very valuable to get that included as well as, you know, the the sort of more academic outputs that come out of the project. I think the, um, the wee animation as well was good because in these days of sort of social media, it's uh -huh. it's very useful to try to distill down the, the findings from the research and be able to share them online in a, in a format that people will engage with. Mm -hmm. and, and Seamus, you're you're part of the group, the Irish Islanders Marine Resource Organisation. Is that that's the? Yeah, um, we're a small volunteer group um, based on the offshore islands. So we have um, members in four counties: Donegal, Mayo, Galway, and Cork, just on the offshore islands. And um, the sort of legal structure was set up in 2014, but we've been around since probably 2008, 2009. Um, and it is an ongoing process as well. I mean, this work is still underway. Um, we're still trying to change policy and make make the smaller um, operators more visible. Mm -hmm. And and have you in the or Ruth as well? I mean, have you been able to have had the opportunity to present the film in contexts where whether it's to islanders themselves or policy people that you're trying to kind of help explain this to and whatever mm -hmm. audiences. Um, you had the opportunity to to show it to people basically i guess so far other than in, in such academic context yeah no it's mainly been in academic context so far like different again because it was produced during during covid um mm -hmm. um but i know the um the irish mep who i work for luke ming flanagan um was particularly taken with this so i think he kind of shared it in 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 his policy circles but i haven't been i haven't presented it um outside of kind of academic webinars um so far so i called him luke campbell sorry luke flanagan sorry that was uh, luke, <laughs> luke campbell as a geographer <laughs> apologies for that um i mean it'll be interesting to see i mean i guess that when we we had spoken before as well there's you know using these creative methods there's w one aspect is about a you know an increasing impact and, and trying to kind of get research to to wider audiences and make it accessible um and, and maybe not just even the research as you say often the the kind of policy and governance setting is, is very off-putting in itself. It's very inaccessible. It's very technical. So the language used is, you know, it's not just that uh, um, it, it, put, it tears people even from engaging. So this is a way not just to make your research accessible, but the, the, the issues going on. Um, but also this question of, of kind of more how using these methods changes the kind of nature of what you're doing, not just that here's a way to express research or distribute research, but to rethink what research is and, and how to get into those, like the multiple voices and that complexity. Um, I'll, I'll take some of the questions from, from the side here. There's a comment first from uh, Brian O'Reardon. He said, love the, love the words, voices of the respondents put into verse, works really well and communicates the issues faced by communities loud and clear. And the animation works really well too. Great stuff, excellent material. We, did you mention that Brian was also joining us from? Uh... Right. Brian. So Brian is based in Brussels and he heads up Life, the Low Impact Fishers of Europe. So again, another uh, 
Hey, Brian. <laughs> Hi, yeah, yeah. I was just another fantastic off the voice of the discussion. Uh, <laughs> just got working uh, office from home, so uh, lots of things going on in the background. So uh, switched yeah. everything off to uh, avoid uh, too many distractions. But yeah, I really, really loved your uh, presentation, uh, Ruth. The uh, the voices in verse for me worked really well. Uh, you know, I could really imagine uh, uh, people saying those things. But what they're saying also is um, um, it, it communicates what's happening very strongly to audience, I think, beyond the shores of Ireland. I mean, although it's uh, some perhaps uh, Irish vernacular there, the messages, I think, would be very well identified with in, in coastal communities all around mm -hmm. Europe where very similar uh, processes are, are happening. You know, under the guise of keeping the resources public and, and so on, they are being privatized and uh, ownership uh, concentrated into ever fewer hands and the people who are left in the communities finding it increasingly difficult to, to, to make a living. But no, great, it really, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it was uh, inspiring stuff. And I love the animation as well, the cogwheels turning and the poor little boats getting dragged down to the oh. bottom of the sea and the big ones just, uh, you know, shifting along the top until they bump into the, uh, into the stop sign in the, uh, in the inshore area, which has been completely uh, uh, devastated. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Oh, nice, I really and enjoyed it. Very, ni very nice to, to be joined by uh, people from uh, both the policy side of thing and, and the community mm -hmm. uh, of fishers involved. So uh, thank you both for, for joining in your contributions. I, I'll um, read a couple of these questions from the side. So one comes from Iris Muller, who's our head of department. It says, thanks, Ruth, a really interesting talk and love the film. I wonder whether you could say a little more about the mechanism that would need to be invoked to achieve the diversity of policies that is needed to cater for the diversity of fishing. So I know you said you're not into producing solutions, but yeah. <laughs> we're no. urging you in that direction. No, thanks, thanks, Iris. It's 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 an important question. It's it's a big question, um, and Brian and Seamus can probably jump in here as well. Um, on mechanisms that would need to be invoked. Uh, okay, we have national level and we have EU level. First of all, so at EU level, and there have been just. Um, recent discussions uh, around this on the Pesh of the Fisheries Committee in the EU is around uh, Article 17 of the Common Fisheries Policy, which uh, provides um, that when national, so national member states, when they have their quota allocation, they have complete um, authority over how that is allocated. Article 17 in the Common Fisheries Policy um, provides that uh, social and economic considerations um, can influence their allocation of, uh, and it doesn't specifically mention small small scale communities, small scale fishers, um, but that social and economic considerations should influence the allocation of quota. However, um, it is the bane of everyone's life because Article 17 exists, but it's pretty much unenforceable at European level. So it, because the Commission is very, very clear that it is within solely within the competencies of the member states in how they address these Article 17 measures. So if you go on to the, um, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine website, they actually have a section saying we're addressing Article 17 by putting in place um, these particular carve outs. So, for example, there is a carve out of X amount of this quota species um, for uh, small for boats under 12 meters um, who are doing line fishing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that kind of brings me to the next part of the question of the, what, what measures are needed in uh, what mechanisms would be needed at a national level. The mechanisms needed at a national level are more complicated because even though you have those carve outs there, the, the animation shows that this is not working. And the reason that this is not working is because the entire system has been designed around large scale vessels and assumptions assumptions that kind of favor the large scale vessels and how large scale vessels, vessels operate. So. The mechanisms needed to be invoked to achieve the diversity of policies is actually questioning the whole system on which the fisheries uh, quota allocation system is based. Um, so it's uh, and, and it's quite a big ask. Um, and it's and it's also and part of that the, the academic paper or the other academic paper, the kind of the not the poetry paper, but there's another paper that is um, uh, I've just resubmitted with revisions. And what what I've done in that is I have um, identified 
uh, different historical assumptions that are underpinning um, the fisheries governance system uh, in Ireland um, that generally remain uh, that generally re remain invisible, and it is making those visible and questioning those and bringing those into the discussion and bringing uh, and then informing a discussion around well actually this system which is supposedly based on equal treatment is actually not equitable because it kind of falls out differently for for the smaller boats and the larger boats yeah, i was thinking a lot when, when uh reading this and listening to you again and also what, what brian was saying i mean this is a mm -hmm. brings back you you, you talk about political ecology and kind of frame partly what you're yeah. you're doing in kind of terms of political ecology but the idea of the the theory of access you know, uh, uh, Jesse Rebo and Nancy Peluso, mm -hmm. where changes of, of resource governance are not necessarily, we can't look at them just in terms of property. So who is a private property or public property, but it's yeah. rather modes of access. And that can happen yeah. within the public domain, such as yeah. I think this is exactly what we're seeing here. So it's yeah. a kind of privatization by access yeah. rather than than ownership per se and and, and the way the state is involved yeah. in, in shaping the, the and, market and, and this is a huge contradiction in this because the, the the government does like genuinely it wants to protect this fisheries as a public resource and like it's the, the bit i read out this is actually its language it's like to stop the rights being being concentrated in the hands of the larger communities to make sure that smaller communities can access these fishing opportunities where they don't have other economic opportunities in the islands but this is not what's happening in practice um, and 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 yet they and ironically the 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 kind of the bill the island fisheries heritage license bill that was uh, tabled in 2017 which was looking for ring banks fenced access to a small amount less than one percent of the national quota so island fishers could access this in a seasonal kind of way that 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 works for the islands that was framed by the government as being a step towards privatization but at mm -hmm. the moment what we have is a system which is in practice looks like a privatized system even though in theory fisheries is protected as a public resource or quota control species mm -hmm. are protected as a public resource yeah, the kind of yeah those modes of access are really really important here problems mm -hmm. of kind of concession systems um mm -hmm. Uh, Seamus Brennock uh, just writes a, a comment, says, as an inshore fisherman, the poem resonates to all coast, coastal fishers. There's little that separates small uh, scale coastal fishers on the mainland from island fishers. We have the same problems. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of questions of, 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 of uh, scale there. Um, yeah. So j just a comment on that. Yeah. Thank you, Seamus, for, uh, for that comment. Absolutely. I mean, as I, the, the video showed, like 86 percent of our fleet are inshore fishers um, and uh, small scale, small scale boats. What I learned, though, from being on the islands and from uh, working closely with island fishers uh, is that, yes, there are problems faced by small scale fishers generally, which you share. Living on an island and being an island fisher means that you have extra steps. And it came out in that poem as well, saying people on the mainland can land their boat into the mainland and they can go up to their house. So we're getting into like really, really nitty gritty detail here. Because I, I remember asking an island fisher, can you just explain to me like step by step what happens? So, for example, uh, one of the island fishers said to me, OK, if I'm out fishing and it's winter and the light is going down and the buyer is not coming to the uh, to the mainland port until maybe six, six o'clock in the evening, well, I need to try to arrange a buyer at an earlier time because I need to get to there, offload, give my stuff to the buyer, come back, uh, have time to get back while it's still light to the island. Uh, we probably don't necessarily have infrastructure on the island for me to tie my boat up to the pier on the island. So I'm on a mooring. If I'm on a mooring, it means that I have a boarding boat. So there still has to be light and safe enough conditions to get from my fishing boat into the mooring boat to get from the mooring boat then back to the island while it's still light while it's still safe if you think of it the other way around there's also the issue of loading the island boat with bait again you have to go from the island onto the boarding boat get the bait onto there the conditions have to be adequate um for the for, for, for the boarding boat to get out to the fishing boat and to load the bait bait on so so yes you definitely have have uh, problems that are shared but the one thing that came up again and again and that I really understood after spending um, months on the island, several months on the island doing field work was all these extra steps that operate to frustrate um, the access to, 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 to fishing for, for small island fishers. But you, you certainly have shared problems. I will definitely agree on that. This is the, the complexities of here again, right? the mm -hmm. specificities of place. There's a question came from, from Kian, uh, he's in the department here. He says, thanks Ruth. Could you talk a bit about the process of collaboration on the video? How close did you work together 
mm. to work out visuals, representations, and uh, etc. Yeah, thanks, Kian. Uh, hi, Kian. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, with 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 this video and also in the other art science collaborations I've done, working with Stephen Hurl and with uh, Mish Rosanoff on this video. So initially, um, the musician didn't come in until the end. So Mish and I worked extremely closely together from the start. Um, and for me, it's it's always important to have a, a very good working relationship with the artists that I work with because I do work very closely with them in 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 the way that um, that I carry out art science collaborations. So what what the process uh, normally when I'm working with Mish is that we will have kind of a, a long conversation, first of all, and um, I will kind of just explain to him the story about what's going on um, in the research um, and what I'm trying to visualize. Uh, he will kind of come back to me with with different questions to make sure he understands it. Um, and also, yeah, the, well, that's the other thing. It's important to work with an artist that can, that can grasp like really complex uh, uh, concepts as well. Um, and then what uh, what Mish, then we 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 discuss the aesthetic as well because I always, I, I also contribute to, to to the aesthetic and I had kind of an idea of the kind of aesthetic that I wanted for that. Um, and while we're talking, uh, he'll be drawing, and so uh, and then what he will will do is he'll kind of hold up kind of several drawings as we go along. Go, I'm thinking of this or I'm thinking of this or I'm thinking I'm thinking of that. Uh, so for example, um, when. Uh, because it's it's as you can see from the animation, it's so technical and so technocratic. I mean, with things like uh, tonnage and kilowatts and track record. And um, so it was Mish that came up with the idea of visualizing that as as a grid and putting kind of the boats on on a grid. So that's really where kind of uh, the the artist like really really um, kind of comes into play there is is like I will have the kind of the nitty gritty of the concepts I will maybe know the aesthetic but I won't know what way it is that I want to visualize it but we will go back and forth or we did go back and forth on kind of different ways of uh, visualizing things and for example I don't know if you remember from the animation but you see you can see the small boat um when it goes back to its mooring it's on a mooring initially I think in something that Mish had sent me it was uh, it was um, tied up to the mainland, and I said no, 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 it can't be tied to the mainland because this is a really specific problem for island boats. I want it to be on a mooring, and I want there to be a little boat on the mainland just to have a visual of that extra step that's there. So it's it's a very um, involved process of kind of back and forth. So I then also wrote the the narrative. And then, but then equally, Mish would have kind of contributed to, to, to the narrative. He's a filmmaker as well. So we would have worked on the, so I would have written the text and then we would have worked on that um, together in terms of the editing and the shortening of it. Um, and then uh, we were going on, on the sound design. I really wanted music that, uh, I really wanted music and sound that was of the islands and from the islands. Um, so that's when it was actually through Seamus that the lang Irish language officer on Aranmore Island, uh, Fiona McGlynn, um, Fiona McGlynn, she is a sister of Brian McGlynn. Um, so that's how I kind of came into contact with, with Brian and he agreed to work with us on that. So at that point, it was the three of us working together. Uh, we sent Brian the animation, which didn't have any sound. Um, he sent us back initially uh, kind of a, a, the, the music that he had composed for it. Um, and then we came back with some suggestions um, as to uh, as to kind of the um, pacing in certain areas, or the, I think there's a silence in a particular area as well. And he added in, in sound design uh, as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's like that in, in all art science collaborations, but certainly in the ones that I've um, uh, that I've been working in, we're all very much involved in kind of all aspects of it. But I think that's particularly the artists that I that, that I choose to work with as well, or that I have worked with in the past are um, involved in, in very much in kind of socially engaged art. I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned the music. I was actually one of the things I was going to, to ask you about the music. Um, I mean, it's been very, uh, what, I'm sure you're aware of what's happening in Dublin recently with the kind of uh, the plans to knock down most of the cobblestone pub and uh, in Smithfield yeah. and, and build a, a hotel there, a nine story mm -hmm. hotel. And then the kind of protest that this has generated, which is yeah. not really just about the cobblestone, it's about the nature yeah. of development in Dublin and Ireland more broadly, yeah. urban development and, and the, the role that traditional music has played mm -hmm. as something that's under threat, but also mm -hmm. as a mobilizing force for these kind of like, and again, there's questions of locality, questions of scale, 
mm. you know, large scale economic interests, um, whether they be national or international interests, squeezing out local um, producers and local businesses mm. um, and the communities built around them. So there's, you know, different sphere altogether. But uh, um, Kian says it's great. Gears, uh, imagine of sinking the small boats is very effective. Or the image, the, the gears image, sinking the small boats is, is very effective. Yeah, that that was and that that was just genius when when Mish came up with that because it's like how are we going to vi visualize this? And he said, I have this image in my head of just kind of cogs in a wheel being ground down, and he sent a very kind of rough drawing of it. He did a really really rough animation, and that was kind of the core. Actually, yeah, thanks for um reminding me of that, Key, and that was the core image that we started with. Actually. It was that, and that is the key, uh, the key image, I think, when you have that kind of grinding the cogs with all the different requirements on it, and they the the kind of large boat is able to sail across the, the top because it's built around that 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 kind of a boat, that system it's built around the system is built for that kind of boat. Whereas um the smaller boats can get caught on one or many of these requirements um and then get unintentionally crushed kind of by the system. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 interesting to think of these uh, the way you're talking about the the way you construct the visualizations and the the, the aesthetic choices that go into it, how they're trying to narrate uh, processes that go on, um, mm. in the sense, okay, this is a creative method. It's not the usual method for either social science or or physical science and in, in, uh, in geography or environmental studies, but actually, when you're looking at how uh, in environmental research and the kind of physical sciences is visualized i mean there's these same processes happen okay but it's not just graphs and so on there's been a realization within the scientific community of we need to produce kind of maybe policy facing mm. and public facing visualizations and mm. i was teaching on monday the the planetary boundaries from the stockholm resilience center so i'm sure that everyone's probably fairly familiar with. i've seen it certainly at least to this kind of globe cut into segments where there's kind of green yellow amber red like a traffic light system of, of risks in the different spheres and it's for, in one sense, it's very effective at capturing mm -hmm. this kind of complexity of Earth systems science, but it completely fails because there's too much complexity for a static image to capture. And I think one yeah. of the things here is the, the pro procedural aspect of what you're seeing with like, the gears, for example, whereas charts and so on, when they're uh, static, they don't have that capacity to, to yeah. show process. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why I've always worked or tended to try to work with moving images as well. And um, particularly in the conservation conflict that I mentioned earlier, I was really struck by the kind of the static nature and the 2D nature of the kind of this, the Scottish Natural Heritage the Conservation Agency's map that was being used in consultations and kind of my lived experience of being out on the boats with 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 fishers, which was an entirely different world and how none of this was captured within that map um, and how that was con contributing to the conflict because people just didn't feel represented at all or seen. Uh, in the in the map that was being used to kind of show where the biodiversity was going to be protected. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Does does anyone else have uh, any questions or comments they want to jump in with? I have a I have one last, uh, but it's rather a major uh, question. So, <laughs> um, Seamus, Seamus here, oh, yeah. just a comment. Um, going back to the question on you know what, what could be done to to sort out the issues. I suppose our take is um, you know listen to the smaller um, operators because often they're not heard. Um, the bigger industrial end of things have a disproportionate influence as far as you know the, the small scale uh, fishers are concerned. So getting awareness um, through projects like this um, to bring the issues to the likes of policymakers because often they don't have the time to to spend and in getting into the technical nitty gritty because it is very technical and um, you know, people are afraid to make mistakes or whatever if they don't fully understand the issues. So I think projects like this are really important and and making um, both, I suppose, academia aware, but the the people who are making the decisions on a day to day basis as well. Thanks. And sorry, thanks, Seamus. And yeah, and sorry, one more thing I wanted to add. Um, you asked me earlier. Um, Rory about who had seen say the poems or the animation or whatever and I was like well, I haven't been able to distribute it I completely forgot so I published several articles in uh, two fishing industry magazines one was the skipper 
and the other was the Marine Times. Um, so uh, some of the poems have been published there and mm. images from the animation and the link from the animation. Obviously, the animation can't be contained in the paper. Um, so I, I think there were probably about three or four articles during the course of the research project in the Skipper. And that was deliberate as well to try to reach the wider fishing industry. And uh, in the Marine Times, there was something specific to women in fisheries. Um, mm. So, yeah, I just remember that. <laughs> So one one question that I was going to ask there, but um, is about Brexit and the kind of uh, fallout from this. And obviously, there's been a lot of controversy around uh, Brexit and, and fisheries, including within Ireland, and, and the mm. the speed with which the agreement was reached uh, last for the last uh, Christmas, and uh, um, and the effects that that had on the quota. Is is the, is those changes to the quota? Is that making any? Is that filtering down to make um, further problems in, in relation to the issues you're talking about, or is it? I see Brian uh, rustling in his chair there as well. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna let either Brian or Seamus take that one <laughs> because they're much more up to speed with what's happening on the ground on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it probably exacerbates the problems for the small scale sector. Um, there was a very interesting discussion in the Parliament the other day on Article 17, where you had a representative from the pelagic freezer trawlers. These are the big trawlers which are 120 meters long. Most of the vessel is taken up with processing capacity. So they're uh -huh. processing something like 400 tons of fish a day, putting them into 20 kilo boxes and sending them all, all around the world, which is a very different kind of fishing that's going on with the small guys who are catching a few kilos, uh, probably selling it on the local market, taking a little bit home. So it's two really different kinds of production, two really different markets, two completely different kinds of business. And this guy was saying that um, small scale fishing doesn't need to have access to quotas. They just fall back on what are called the non-quota species. Mm -hmm. Whereas the large scale sector need to have access to quotas because, uh, you know, they're producing all the fish. And it's, it's true that, you know, 95 percent of the fish catch in Europe comes from these larger scale enterprises, uh, which account for whatever it is, 15 percent of the boats, whereas the majority fleet and the probably 50 percent of the um, actual jobs in fishing are actually dependent on 5% of the catch. And that's because they've been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and have to fall back on this non-quota species. So of course, Brexit is all about quota and access to waters. And the, um, the access to waters is for larger fleets because uh, you know, the small island boats aren't going to be off uh, fishing in uh, you know, UK waters and the small boats from the UK aren't going to come over and fish off the, the Porcupine Bank. Um, so this is really um, all to do with the way that larger scale fishing is managed. Um, larger boats have preferential access, uh, access to quota and so on. So yeah, I mean, it really highlights the problem for the small scale sector because they're completely surpassed by this and any quota that may have trickled down their way is now increasingly jealously guarded by the larger scale fleet and Seamus could tell us about the mackerel quota and uh, how uh, a request for a very very small percentage of the increase in quota a couple of years ago was turned down I mean they were talking of a few hundred tons and the increase in quota was I can't remember how much it was but it was about 20 or 30 thousand tons, the actual increase um, to the quota that the larger fleet already had, and they wouldn't give up just a few hundred tons to give to the small inshore sector. It's unbelievable. Brian, um, Seamus, I would love to hand it over to you, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring it to a close because I need to teach. This is the, the modern uh, academy when uh, the multiplicity <laughs> of voices that uh, this meeting has brought uh, has, to, has to be cut short from, uh, from um, the demands of the institution. Um, but uh, thank you very much for, for contributing, uh, Seamus and Brian, and thanks so much, Ruth, for, uh, for, for joining us today and presenting uh, not just your discussion, but the film and, and, the, and the poems as well. And thanks for, for everyone for your questions and, and comments along the, the, the side. Um, no, it was really great, inspiring, in, in, well, for me anyway. It was uh, given me a, a good shot in the arm, a, a booster mm -hmm. to uh, listen in on, on this discussion. Really good. Congratulations to, to all of you, especially to you, Ruth. Really nice stuff.
Thank you very much. Yeah, th thank you everyone for joining and thanks again for the invitation, Rory. I'm glad that I was finally able to take it up. Yes, and, and hopefully we'll get more opportunities to talk. I, th I think I'm going to make here is more complicated the, the byline from my, uh, my TCD geography uh, <laughs> email. This is a brilliant uh, line that you've brought, brought to me. Um, so thank you very much. And I, I'll, uh, I'll close off the recording as well at this point as well.